Welcome to the Cincinnati Asian Art Society's April 23rd program. Hi, I'm Helen Rinsberg. I'm president of the association. Today we welcome back Dr. Jennifer Goodlander. In 2011, she presented the mystical world of Balinese shadow puppetry, including a demonstration with her students, which was really interesting. Today, her focus is on Srikandi, one of the dynamic heroines of the Indonesian version of the Hindu epic, the Mahabharata. Born a woman, she trains as a warrior in order to avenge a wrong that was committed to her in a past life. Throughout Indonesia, Srikandi is held up as a symbol for gender equality and appears in both traditional performances and popular culture. Dr. Goodlander will share the history and legacy of this amazing character through puppetry, film, dance, and other art forms from around the archipelago. Jennifer Goodlander is Associate Professor at Indiana University and the Department of Comparative Literature, where she teaches classes on Indonesia and global theater, literature, and other arts. Jennifer has published numerous articles and two books, Women in the Shadows, Gender, Puppets, and the Power of Tradition in Bali from the Ohio University Press in 2016, and Puppets in Cities, Articulating Identities in Southeast Asia from Bloomsbury Methune Drama 2018. She has performed Balinese Wayong Kulat, or Shadow Puppetry, at international festivals and around the United States. Her current research looks at transnational South Asian identities as expressed in performance, literature, and art. Jennifer is the recent past president of the Association of Asian Performances, and something we learned at lunch today, a roller derby girl. Uh, only a couple broken bones so far. <laughs> Let's please welcome Dr. Jennifer Goodlander. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you so much for having me. I was absolutely tickled when Helen reached out and asked me to come back, and um, I'm excited to be able to speak with you and share some things about Indonesian Wayang again. So in thinking about this talk, I had kind of three main areas or questions that I wanted to, to focus on. One is how the character of Sri Kandi is a way to understand Indonesian culture and history. The other is what does the story of Sri Kandi reveal about gender, especially women in Indonesia? And how do traditional stories change uh, to meet the needs of contemporary society. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of cultural and historical context. I realize I'm speaking to an audience of Asian enthusiasts, so some of this may be review, but I sort of want to make sure we're all on the same page. So the country of Indonesia is part of Southeast Asia, which includes countries like Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, Singapore, the Philippines. And uh, it's also neighbors to China, uh, Japan, Korea, and India, and has shares cultural influences from all of those areas. So Indonesia is a large archipelago and uh, diverse islands and cultures. The national motto is unity in diversity. And I'll be focusing uh, primarily on the arts of Java and Bali today. So that gives you just a chance to sort of situate where those are in Indonesia. But some basic statistics on Indonesia. The population is about 255 million and growing. It makes it the fourth largest country in the world. It is also the most populous Muslim country 
in the world. As I said, there's many, many, many islands. Counts vary, but uh, some are around 17,000. Um, but of course, most people live on Java and Bali. There are 300 distinct ethnic groups and languages and cultures. And as we compare Balinese and Javanese, Wayang, you'll see that there's, there's some real differences uh, between those. Major religions are Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Christianity, both Catholics um, and Protestants. And then also, historically, Indonesia became independent in 1949. It was proclaimed in 1945 and was a Dutch colony for 400 years. So just some quick history of these cultural influences. A um, lot of Indonesian culture, especially that I'm talking about today, comes from India, uh, Hinduism and Buddhism, uh, the temples of Prabhanan, Bora uh, but also via India, important is the spread of Islam uh, during the Majapayat and it's thought that uh, the, the kingdoms of Majapayat that were Hindu, a number of them moved to the island of Bali. So Bali is sort of a repository of ancient Javanese culture. And then in 1555, Dutch colonialism began. And as I said, just again, again orient you to Java and the little island of Bali. All right, so now we're going to move on to the story, the complex story of Sri Kandi. And Sri Kandi is one of the many, many tales in the Mahabharata, which is a long, began as an oral epic poem around 3rd century BC, uh, AD in India, and came to Indonesia, I'm checking my dates, um, around 900. AD as well. The version of the Mahabharata that exists in the stories that are focused on in Indonesia are quite different from those of India. And also some of the pronunciations of the names and characters are different. So if you're more familiar with the Indian and you're hearing a variance, that is why I'm, I'm using Indonesian pronunciations. But just to give you an idea of the scope of this work, if you took the Odyssey and the Iliad and combined them, the Mahabharata is 10 times those works in length. So very, 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 very long. But the main story is uh, the epic battles between two family groups, the Korowas and the Pandavas. The Pandavas are five brothers, and the Korowas are their cousins, and there's a hundred of them. Generally, the Pandavas are thought of the good guys, the heroes of the Mahabharata, and the Korowas are, are the bad guys. So the story of Sri Kandi actually begins a generation before she is born with uh, the story of Princess Amba. Amba is the most beautiful of three sisters. And during the ceremony where they are going to, to name their, their future husbands, uh, they are kidnapped by Bhisma. And Bhisma is the son of another king, but his mother died, and Bhisma's father fell in love with another woman. But she didn't want to marry him because she was worried that her sons would not be the next in line for the throne, and they were just signing up for lots and lots of family drama. Bhisma promised that he would take a vow of celibacy and that he would therefore abscond the throne and give it to his future half-brother. The gods thought that this was so generous of Bhisma that they gave him a, a boon, a token, that Bhisma would be allowed to choose the time and place of his death. No one could kill him unless he said it was okay. So Bhisma's younger brother, and, and Bhisma actually ended up loving his younger brother, so he kidnaps Amba and the other two sisters in order to present them as a gift 
for marriage for his younger brother. But Amba complains that she's already really in love with a prince named Sawa and that she can't possibly marry someone else. Bisma takes pity on her and returns her back home so she can marry her prince. But her prince says he's kind of embarrassed that Bisma was able to kidnap his betrothed, and now she's already been in this other kingdom. So he refuses to marry her. She's already kind of used goods. So Amba returns, and Bisma's brother doesn't want to marry her because she's in love with someone else. You don't want a wife who's in love with someone else. So she tells Bisma that he must marry her. Because for women, they don't have any social identity without being married. She would be an outcast in her society and have no future if she could not find a husband. Uh, Bisma says, well, I have a vow of celibacy and, and can't marry you either. Either. And so here is where then there's several different versions of what happens. In a number of versions, Amba then retreats to the forest and becomes a hermit, kind of meditating and, and giving offerings to the gods. The god Shiva comes down and rewards her for this and says, in your next life, you will be reborn and able to revenge Bhisma. In other versions of the story, Bhisma falls in love with the Princess Amba, but still can't marry her. She ends up chasing him to all corners of the earth. And finally, he takes a bow and arrow and threatens to, to take her life if she doesn't stop it and desist. And I forgot to go forward on my slide. There's Bisma. If she doesn't stop it and desist, and, um, but his hand slips and he shoots an arrow, killing his beloved. And so as she's dying in his arms, he promises her when she is reborn, she will be the one who will be allowed to take his life. And therefore, their souls of Amba and Bisma will be able to be reunited. So Amba is reborn as Srikandi. And again, in some versions of the story, Srikandi is a woman, but um, was the only uh, daughter of her father, Drupada, who um, had waited so long to have a child and was praying to the gods to please give a son. And Shiva said, well, we'll give you a child who is neither a boy or a girl. So Srikandi is born as a girl, but he raises Srikandi as a boy, teaching her, him, how to be an archer, uh, weds him to a, a neighboring princess, but of course this princess complains that her husband is not really a man. Srikandi is embarrassed, retreats to the forest, and is able to trade sexes with a forest hermit, and is able to go back and prove she's a man. Um, in other versions of the story, Srikandi is born as a man, but remembers uh, his life as Amba, uh, and is, is sort of a transgender character. And still other versions of the story, Srikandi is, is a girl, but who loves archery and is, is trained as an archer uh, by Arjuna, who falls in love with her. She even becomes one of Arjuna's uh, wives. Um, but anyways, in all of these versions of the story, she ends up fighting in the battle between the Pandavas and the Kauravas. And Bhisma always loved the Pandavas, but he ends up fighting on the Kauravas side. Of course, no one can kill him. He's killing thousands of other soldiers. Finally, Arjuna and Srikandi go in order to take care of Bhisma. And again, the versions are different. In some, Srikandi is just in front of Arjuna as a shield, and Bhisma refuses to, to attack her, and Arjuna is able to shoot the fatal arrow. In others, Srikandi is the one who shoots the fatal arrow. And of course, Bhisma remembers that this was Amba and that uh, this was, was how he was fated to end. All right, so after all of those. <laughs> so now to look really at, at how this story and, and what the meanings are of this story in Indonesia. So I'm going to focus a little bit on Wayang, uh, what it is, and um, how it relates to identity in Indonesia. 
So the stories of the Mahabharata, like Srikhandi, are recounted over and over and over again in all different kinds of performance, in shadow puppetry, in, in dance, in oral storytelling, and even today in comic books, film. There was an amusement park that was based on the stories of the Mahabharata, although there's a story where uh, the character of Bhima goes down and there's fire and flames and the roller coaster caught on fire fire and, and burnt down the amusement park. <laughs> so Wayang isn't synonymous with puppetry. Rather, the word Wayang has a couple different meanings. In Bali, uh, it was always explained to me that Wayang primarily means like mirror or reflection. And of course, we're familiar with that idea that theater and performance are a mirror of society. Uh, in Java, Wayang often is translated as meaning journey, or um, not necessarily that it is a travel, but that it's, it's dramatizing travel, but also kind of change in people. Um, kulit, then for Wayang Kulit means leather. There's also Wayang Wong, which is uh, Wayang with people, a dance form. There's Wayang Klitik, which are uh, two-dimensional wooden puppets. There's Wayang Beber, which is a, a puppeteer or dalang sitting next to a squirrel telling a story. So there's many, many different permeations of this art form. And it has been named UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage. So the other emphasis thing I want to really emphasize is we tend to think of like these types of traditional performances as perhaps in the village, mystical, primitive. But in Indonesia, these stories, these performances, and these ideas are just interwoven into present day culture. There isn't that sort of tradition modernity divide. Um, so I want to kind of demonstrate how even in the performance, Wayang connects a mythic past to the present. Udo! Chadanako makoruo! Tadla! Nagi nyu karo kayo manke! Ulu! Narara padangun tempo! Hane! Nindro kilo giri! Mwah! Ha! 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 Oh my goodness. Hi, everybody. My name is Twalen, and I'm one of the Panasar or, or servant characters in the Wayang performance. Oh, it's my job to translate the performance for the audience. You see, this is Arjuna, and he's speaking Kawi, which is an ancient Javanese court language. Who here speaks Kawi? Raise your hand. Raise it high. No one? Oh, that's okay. You know, in Bali, they don't speak Kawi either. That's why they need us to translate the performance. It's, it's kind of like, you know, how old Catholic services are in Latin, but no one understands it. Yes, it's like that. Anyways, I can tell you what Arjuna is talking about. He is worried because the war has gone on and on. I mean, even longer than the war between Kuwait and Russia. Oh, and he is so sad because of all the people who are killed. Oh, he wants to try to figure out what to do. So he wants to go up the mountain in Rokilogiri and meditate oh, in order to get wisdom from the gods. Yes, yes, I think that's a great idea. Oh, people would learn so much more by doing something like that. We should tell Putin, right? Anyways, anyways, I think that learning new things is so fantastic. I mean, just like here with the Asian Art Society. Oh, they're learning all about Asian culture and history through the arts. I'm so happy we can be part of that. Yes, yes, thank you for having us. So you see, that's actually really typical to how that would be performed for an audience. Uh, the puppeteer or Dalong would pay attention to what's happening in current events. 
Pay attention, talk with the village leaders. What's going on? What's the gossip? What are maybe some of the problems that should be addressed in the performance? And the panasar or clown characters will break that fourth wall and sometimes speak directly to the audience, make jokes, comment on the things that are happening. So it takes this old mythic story and makes it incredibly real and, and vital for the audience. Also, through the history of, of the young nation of Indonesia, why young characters have been sort of a touchstone for articulating desirable and undesirable qualities uh, for Indonesians. Uh, the first president, President Sukarno, would quite often, I mean, he would talk about himself as a, a puppeteer, a dalang, but he would also compare himself to the character Arjuna, the same one who was right there. And, um, and that uh, Arjuna is known as a, a skilled archer, for being very, very wise, a, an excellent leader. Also, uh, President Sukarno is known for kind of his many affairs with women. And Arjuna also was quite a ladies' man and had many, many, many affairs with different women. So it was also a way for him to kind of make an excuse for maybe the not so good parts of his personality. Uh, Benedict Anderson is just one of many, many scholars uh, of Indonesia arts and culture to talk about Wayang as a model for Javanese life. So I also wanted just to give a little bit more background about the puppets, to quick talk about how they're made, what they're made of, and I will be passing some of the puppets around in just a moment. But I have two different types of puppets here. So one is the Balinese, and that's the white one here. And these are both the same character of Arjuna. And then this one is the Javanese version of Arjuna. And this is uh, the solo style of puppets as well. So you can see there's quite a few similarities. They both have a similar hairdo, wearing kind of a similar costume. But there's also a lot of differences in terms of, you know, the size, the stature of the puppets. It's not completely known. Remember, as I said, Balinese culture is thought to be influenced or a repository of ancient Javanese culture. So perhaps during the Majapayat, the puppets looked more like this. And then when they went to Bali, they remained like this. In, um, in Bali, is mostly Hindu. And these the performance is an important part of religion. It's a necessary performance to have for rituals to be efficacious. A dalang or puppeteer is, is thought as a kind of priest. They're able to make holy water. There's offerings that are given as part of that. So like the gods speak through the puppets. The puppets are a entertainment for the gods. Where in Java, because most of the people are Muslim, the puppets have a very different relationship to the culture. The Mahabharata is seen as a type of mythic history of Java. The characters are there to give examples of how people should act. But within Islam, there is a um, censor against performance or human performance or making things that look like humans. And so these puppets with their exaggerated size and arms, it's thought in order to make it sort of fit within the tenets of Islam is, is one of the many, many thoughts on why these evolved as different. I'm going to keep my Balinese Arjuna for a moment, but I'm going to go ahead and pass around the Javanese. Um, the Javanese ones also are made out of buffalo skin. Uh, they are all carved in a very similar manner to that using the metal tools. Uh, 
These and the court sets would be made with gold leaf, so the puppets are extremely valuable. Uh, today, most of the puppets in both Bali and Java are painted with acrylic paints. Quite often when I go back to Bali, my puppet teacher is always asking me to bring good paint. He can't get as nice a paint in Bali. They, of course, used to use natural dyes, but it would take many, many, many layers, and the puppets were not anywhere near as, as beautiful and as fine as these. The Balinese ones are made out of cow leather as well. A number of the sticks are made out of buffalo horn on the Javanese one. That's less common on the Balinese, but as I pass this around, you can't harm it. They actually get used pretty roughly in performance, so feel free to, to move it around to, to look at it, they're quite fun. So to understand the characters and the iconography and how they communicate their identity to the audience, as I said, the Pandavas are kind of the good guys and the Korawas are kind of the bad guys, but that's not really quite accurate. Rather, Balinese especially has a, a sense of What's desirable is balance, and that you need to have bad in order to even recognize the good. So a lot of world religions like Christianity are about the good triumphing over evil, where in Bali it's about the balancing of good and evil. So thinking of the characters as good guys, bad guys, isn't quite accurate. Rather, it's better to think of them as Aulis and Kassar, or refined and unrefined. So an Aulis character has a small body, is slim, delicate, the head is looking down, you know, very, very humble, uh, the nose is long, narrow, uh, the eyes are long and pointed and small, the mouth would be tiny and closed, the stance small. And then Kassar is basically the opposite of all of those. So let's look at some examples. Um, who of these puppets do you think is the most Kassar? Go ahead and shout it out if you can. Center. The center one, maybe? The green guy, yeah, yeah. Although you're right, the one in the middle is kind of Kassar. So yes, the most Kassar one is Momosi Moko. He's a, one of the big demon bad guys, always abducting the princesses, trying to kill Arjuna, wreak havoc in the heavens. And as you can see, he's really big and, and ugly and Kassar. But in contrast, so this is Bhima. Get my puppet assistant to come up here. This is Bhima, who is one of Arjuna's brothers, one of the Pandavas. So he is one of the good guys. But wait, he has bulging eyes. He has these like big claws on his hands. He has a big stance. He's a big guy in comparison to Arjuna. Well, and that's not because he's kind of a good or bad character, but rather he has a temper. He, he loses his cool. He ends up, you know, gutting people who say something mean to him. He likes to hang out uh, in, in the netherworld. He acts rashly without thinking. So rather than good or bad, he's, he's a good guy, but like humans, not all of his traits are, are perhaps good. Actually, one of the most Aulis puppets, even more Aulis than Arjuna, and I apologize, I didn't think to bring him, is Yudhisthira, who's another one of the Pandava brothers. But Yudhisthira uh, has a gambling problem. And the Korawas challenge the Pandavas to a dice game, and Yudhisthira can't stop playing, even though it's set up. They're not going to win. The Korawas keep winning. He gives away all his money, all of his clothes, the kingdom, all of their wives, his brothers, himself. He gambles away everything. So even though he's, he's very refined, he's not necessarily always good. So I'll go ahead and pass these guys around. All right, so you're thinking, but wait a second, where's the women? Why haven't we talked about the women yet? So now we're going to switch our focus and look at some of the women characters. Um, one of the things that's interesting is one of the first times I went and was trying to buy 
puppets. Um, and I was like, well, can I get some female puppets? I was told, yeah, you can just get a couple. They're interchangeable. It doesn't really matter. And you can watch entire performances without seeing a single female character. But there are women characters, and they're very interesting. So just to give a little cultural background about women in Indonesia, and one of the things that's interesting is um, early visitors to Indonesia, early anthropologists in the 20th century, argued that gender must be more egalitarian in Indonesia than it is in the US. I mean, look at the picture of the, the two people there wearing kind of traditional clothes, and that's what they based it on is in the US, you know, in, in the West, women wore dresses and men wore pants. But, oh, here everyone is wearing a sarong around their waist. Uh, and in the villages, everyone was topless. Uh, so they're dressed the same. They must be kind of the same. But that's not quite right. Again, just like good and bad is a little bit different in Indonesia, gender is a little bit different as well. So men and women are, are confined by their kodrat, which is sort of their inherent nature. The idea that women should be in the home, raise children, men should be the ones who are strong, who are warriors, who are involved in politi uh, politics, is following their kodrat. Uh, when then Indonesia became a nation, the Indonesian constitution, unlike ours here in the US, promises gender equality. But again, that looks a little bit different. The um, government felt that women needed to follow their kodrat and men needed to follow their kodrat in order to make a strong nation. Women should be dutiful wives and mothers. And this was even became public policy as state ibuism. Aibu means mother. And of course, a few other things to keep in mind is that Indonesia still has the practice of polygamy, not necessarily widespread, but it does exist as well. The government also had a lot of policies to promote the happy family, the number of children that women could have. And for women who were outside of this, uh, were, were really punished by being called witches. There's a number of characters within Indonesian stories of the, the dangerous widow witch. It was always a little bit suspect after a woman's husband died and she continued living. And even there's a number of, of Wayang characters who are exalted as examples that women should follow, who after their husband dies, burn themselves in the funeral pyre in order to follow their husbands. Also, it's thought that Currently, Western influences on women, so women who, who date or have sex before marriage, uh, who want to work outside of the home, uh, who are interested in um, education and um, reform for girls, um, it's really kind of criminalized or, or um, forbidden, and it's, it's considered what's the really bad Western influence happening in Indonesia for, for women to, to want to be able to achieve these different things. Uh, I read a recent newspaper article that was even talking about uh, there's a, a push for more women to be involved in politics, but that's because it's thought that they'll bring their, the qualities of a wife and a mother, and that will help the country of Indonesia. So it's not just sort of social norms, but it's also really tied to national rhetoric and that women following being wives and mothers is just as important to the success of the state as anything else. It's also interesting, some of you may be going, but wait a second, Indonesia had a woman president. We haven't managed to do that in the US. And yes, Megawati Sukarno Putri uh, was uh, one of, I think, believe like the fifth president in Indonesia, and I kind of want to talk about two different examples about how power works that allows some women to have power. Uh, for Megawati, her father was Sukarno, Indonesia's first president, and it's thought it was appropriate for her to step into that role when there was really no one else because she had the same sort of the power inherited 
from her father. She was Sukarno's daughter. And um, a more kind of smaller example of this in my own research, looking at women puppeteers in Bali. And um, women have been primarily forbidden from being puppeteers. It's still controversial. But um, Niwaya Nondri was one of the most successful women puppeteers. And her father was a puppeteer. And then she married a really, really successful puppeteer. But after she had three young children, her husband died in an accident. And she was left wondering how she's going to support her family. The only thing she knew was, was wayang, or puppetry. And so she trained with one of her brothers for a few months and started performing and was able to make a living as a puppeteer. And again, it was appropriate for her because she was able to take that power from her father and from her husband. Also, as her sons became old enough to be performers in their own right, she has stepped back and retired and doesn't perform anymore. Even 12 years ago when I interviewed her, she gave the excuse that she was too old and feeble, although she did work full time uh, with her own stall in the market. And I know several male Dalang of the same generation who also performed. So I felt like maybe that was kind of an excuse for her to be able to step aside and let her sons, who as men were perhaps more appropriate, to be puppeteers. So looking at the aesthetics of the Wayang among Alice and Kassar tells us a little bit more about these women characters and how some of them are also examples for women. Um, and I'm keeping an eye on my time. So I'm going to go through these a little bit quickly just so I can hand them out. Supabra is the one in the middle, and she is a powerful nymph. Her headdress gives her the status of kind of a queen, um, but she's able to go into the heavens with Arjuna and uh, help kill the, uh, the, the ogre that's up there. The other one is Draupadi, and she is um, the, the wife of the Pandavas. So among Aulis and Kassar, Aulis has kind of a high status, right? Because Arjuna is most Aulis. Mark Branau did some research ha asking Indonesians to sort of rate puppets from Aulis to Kassar. And many of the Indonesians expressed sort of dissatisfaction with having to include the women characters with the male characters. So even though they are smaller and perhaps more Aulis, they aren't given the same sort of spiritual power that a character like Arjuna has. There are other characters that are more Kassar. Here's the Chondong and Kunti, who is the mother of the Pandavas. Many women say that she is their favorite character. Um, and then also a clown character called Grandmother and an ogre called Dimbi. I'll go ahead and pass these out. And certainly, if there's more curiosity about them, I'll answer more questions. So now back to Sri Kandi, now that we have kind of some background, to see how this story has been used as a, an identity in Indonesia. Um, on one hand, Sri Kandi is held up by the government, by many sources, as a role model for women because she is strong, she gets herself out there, she's brave. Uh, just this is one example. It was an article about women who were leaders in um, companies working towards renewable energy. And many of these articles say that more women should go into leadership roles or be like Srikandi. And this version of Srikandi, though, also emphasizes how Srikandi is a partner and a wife of Arjuna. So the puppet of Srikandi in Java is incredibly feminine. A friend of mine did research on Srikandi about 20 years ago, and there was a warrior version of Srikandi. But in the study that I've done so far, I haven't come across that version. So as gender um, roles have become a little bit t tighter in the last decades or so, Srikandi has really been only imagined as this very feminine wife of Arjuna, which is in real contrast to how the puppet still remains in Bali. And you can see has a much more androgynous form. 
This is a uh, political campaign that used Sri Kandi in 2015. And Tina, if you get a chance, I'll hand these off to you. Uh, that, again, was trying to get more women involved in politics and aiming for 50% of women in political positions as compared to men so that it would reflect the population. And kind of this poster also does comparisons with how many women are in politics compared to women in other Southeast Asian countries. And that in order to be a modern progressive nation, they need more women to be strong like Sri Kandi. There's also a number of women's organizations named for Sri Kandi, uh, like a support organization for women in international, multinational marriages, an environmental organization, uh, but also names of hotels, a tech company, a shipping company. So it's something that's very, very much there in the present day Indonesian imagination. Uh, also, a few years ago, there was a film, a 2000. 16 that told the story of three women archers who won gold in the Seoul Olympics. It was called Tiga Sri Kandi or the three Sri Kandis and they were the first ones to ever win Olympic gold for Indonesia. But Sri Kandi also has been claimed as sort of a radical alternative for women as well. Um, Sri Kandi is an emblem for the LGBTQ movement in Indonesia and held up as a mythic historical example for different gender and sexual identities in the archipelago. And this is becoming more and more important as Indonesia continues to pass uh, stronger and stronger anti-gay legislation uh, that imprisons uh, people who are, are falling outside the norms of, of marriage or heterosexual relationships. Uh, a filmmaker, and this one is available on Amazon Prime and a really interesting film if you're interested, but it was created by a German, Laura Kuppers, a Kuppens, um, in 2012, working with a collective of women in the city of Yogyakarta, uh, looking at weaving the story of Srikandi told in shadow puppetry with the lives of these women and sort of performance art done by these women, looking at lesbian and bisexual identities in Yogyakarta. Uh, also, in my own research in Bali, so this is about 2009, uh, there was a women's Kachek group. Kachek is the monkey chant dance. It's one of the po most popular uh, performances for tourists. It's typically performed with men, but a village decided they wanted to create a performance in order to make money for the village, and they wanted it to do something different. So they would do a women's Kachek group. And normally, Kachek tells the story of uh, the Princess Sita, who's abducted by the ogre Ravana in, um, the, in the Ramayana. But they decided to tell the story of Sri Kandi as an appropriate story for, for women who are strong. And I just wanted to note, of the many endings, in this version, Arjuna is not able to kill Bhisma, but Sri Kandi is able to send out the volley of arrows. And you can kind of see there in the image, the arrows were then carried by the women and the chorus in order to strike Bhisma. So the thing, final thing I'm going to end with is about an eight-minute short film uh, that was uh, an entry in the Toronto International Film Festival that was made by Andrea Normala Wijajanto. And she's a filmmaker from Indonesia who went to film school in Vancouver and um, was really interested in trying to find ways to tell about her Indonesian culture and was really inspired by the story of Sri Kandi, but also sort of really relating it to her own life as a woman who wants to find a career and, and creative expression. And I just want to say, I know for the, the folks who are watching this later online, uh, we will then put a link to the film. It's available on Venmo. All right. Thank you. OK, the question is about um, it, puppetry being so popular. And are you ever asked to teach it at IU? Yes, um, I, IU has a fantastic opera company. Um, I had talked a little bit with one of the composers about perhaps doing a collaboration, but we haven't managed 
to make that work out. I have collaborated a lot with the uh, uh, Indiana Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology. It used to be the Mathers Museum. Uh, I did an exhibition of Indonesian puppetry a number of years ago, and we're working on a much larger exhibition on global puppetry that will include, of course, Indonesia, American puppets, puppets from South Africa and Turkey, uh, as well as some performances. So I've gotten to collaborate with them. Uh, there's Lotus Festival is a large world music festival in Bloomington. And uh, they do a, a program for school children in the spring called Lotus Blossoms. And I've been there featured performer. And in the fall, uh, Dr. Jenny Lale, who's in the theater department, and I are collaborating on a class that's puppets in practice and literature. So we'll be covering a lot of global puppetry and um, both how they appear in, in literature and also getting a chance to make and perform with puppets. But you're right, there has been an explosion of puppetry in the last decade in the US. If you just even look on Broadway, uh, the production of War Horse, uh, where the horse was a big puppet. Uh, this year, Life is uh, Life, uh, Life as Pie, the, the mm. tiger won a special Tony Award. Uh, so there's, there's puppets popping up everywhere. They're really, really magical. So yeah, good question. Weren't they in The Lion King, too? Lion King, of course, with Julie Taymor, yes. And she studied for a while in Bali and Africa. OK, so the question is about the materials and how do they get those intricate holes? Sure. So they're, they're, they are leather. The Bali uses cow leather, and Java uses buffalo hide. And so they, they put the leather on, on a piece of wood and kind of use nails to hold it down. And then they have a set of metal chisels uh, that they you know chisel out all of the different openings. Uh, puppeteers quite often will borrow each other's puppets in order to trace the shapes and borrow each other's designs. When I was there, also borrowing puppets and photocopying them in order to sort of circulate designs is also really, really popular. So a character like Arjuna will always look kind of the same, but it will always have recognizable features as Arjuna. So depending on the maker and when it was made, there's definitely variances. But yeah, the leather makes them quite indestructible uh, unless like mice get at them, but also uh, very, very flexible and easy to use. Makes them rather easy to transport then, too, because aren't they traveling troops often? Yeah, uh, a puppeteer will keep their puppets in a box. Um, a Javanese set is many, many hundreds of puppets. But even in Bali, a puppeteer will usually have between one around 150 puppets wow. for a single performance. I have probably between 150 and 200 puppets at home. I did not bring them all today. <laughs> <laughs> How did you choose which ones to bring then? I was interested in bringing the ones that would probably show most clearly the, the different character designations of Alice and Kassar, and also wanted to bring a variety of the female puppets. As I said, they're still somewhat of a rarity to have so many of them. And I've been really lucky to learn a number of stories that focus on them. One is the story of uh, Supabra. As I said, she's a, a heavenly nymph. There's an ogre who's destroying the heavens, and none of the gods are able to do anything about it. Arjuna, with a magical weapon he had received, is the only one who can do anything. But he needs the help of Supabra, who uh, seduces the ogre in in order to learn what his weakness is, he has kind of an Achilles heel, so she can go back and tell Arjuna where to shoot the arrow. The other story I learned is the story of um, Dimbi, who uh, also transforms into a beautiful woman, and then Bhima falls in love with her, but then realizes that she's an ugly ogre. But Bhima's really OK with that. She's still the person that he loved. So that's kind of a, a fun story with um, you know lots of strong, crazy women characters, uh, but also kind of about the power of loving the person no matter what they look like. The question is, oh, yeah. where, where did the idea of piercing the form to create the shadows come from? Sure. Um, 
histories trace that there's probably puppetry in Indonesia and Southeast Asia since at least 900, uh, if not before, because there's, there's pictures and evidence of them in stone carvings. Um, perhaps the earliest puppets were actually leaves. Um, in, in, shamans would use the leaves to sort of talk and act out stories. And shadow puppetry is a popular art form also in India and China. So some historians think that it what came down with the stories, uh, this way of telling them. But these puppets also do look very different and individual. So perhaps there was a uh, a local type of puppet performance that then was adapted to tell these stories. Uh, so there's a number of kind of different theories on that. Um, especially in Bali, for a puppet to, to, have, to be a good performance, it needs to look alive. And the it, Balinese performances still use a fire instead of an electrical light, which makes the image, it moves even when the, um, even when the puppet is still, like it's alive. It's called kehidupan, and it's one of the really important aesthetics of the puppet. So the light coming through these would make it look much, much more alive. It's interesting, in Bali, they do primarily watch the shadow side. Oh. I'm, I can see it on my screen, but it's not up there. Um, in Java, they mostly watch actually the side with the puppeteer so they can see the beautiful puppets. Uh, it's only sort of like the lower class people who might be watching the, the shadow side. Um, so most people, when I've seen performances, I've even seen ones where the, the screen is up against a wall. So nobody can watch the shadow side, but they're watching these beautiful puppets. And in those performances, I've seen puppeteers even act as almost like a, a Tonight Show host, where they'll talk to the audience. They may interview uh, members of the audience. Uh, one time, I was at a performance with a friend, so we were sitting right up by the puppeteer. And she had told them that I, I was a, a puppeteer in Bali. So. Bali has much more emphasis on the voice, and it sounds so different. And so they, he's like, oh, do some of it, do some of it. And I did, and they, they all laughed and thought it was, it was so funny because it was such a, a different type of puppet. But yeah, so the, even the puppeteer will break the fourth wall. In the film, they talked about the Sindin. In Java, those are two women singers who sit by the stage and also accompany the performance uh, and is an important part of Javanese performance. The question is, how many languages are you familiar with or can you speak? I speak Indonesian fluently. Uh, Indonesian is the national language in Indonesia. It's basically Malay. I think the difference is if you compare Mexican Spanish to the Spanish spoken in Spain, they certainly have diverged a bit, but it's essentially the same language. It was picked as the national language in Indonesia because it was mostly a trade language. It wasn't a language of a particular ethnicity. So you're able to pick a language that a lot of people already know, and you're not showing favoritism to one group over the other. Uh, I also um, speak uh, a good amount of Balinese. Uh, Balinese is one of those languages where there's many different levels, depending on your relationship to the person you're talking to. Uh, and because I'm a foreigner outside of the caste system, I always find it's, it's difficult to speak Balinese with folks because they're not sure where to put me um, and will revert to Indonesian pretty quickly. I also, Kawi is the language that Arjuna was speaking, and um, I'm familiar with quite a bit of Kawi. I have found a lot of Dalang in Bali, no kind of set passages, and we'll use those, and like 90% of the dialogue happens with the clowns. So it's very few Dalang who are actually really fluent or knowledgeable in Kawi. Uh, I've also spent some time studying Khmer, which is the language in Cambodia. Uh, I spent a summer studying Hakalai, which is the uh, one of the languages of the Chin minority from Burma, Indianapolis has a very large Chin community. So they were offering the language as part of a project working and trying to help that community. Um, and I've also studied French and German. Well,
Um, the question was what, how I got into this. Um, I, I've been a theater artist since I was a child and majored in theater and women's studies at, at Kalamazoo College in Michigan. Moved to New York City. I worked as a director in very small, off-off Broadway type companies uh, for a number of years. Reached that point where I really needed a, a master's to continue in my career. I also had fallen in love with martial arts, Kyokushon karate, and wanted to find a way to bring that aesthetic to my theater work. And it's also right around the time that Lion King by Julie Taymor opened on Broadway. So I ended up going to the University of Hawaii, which is internationally known for their program in Asian performance. My MFA is in Asian theater and directing. Uh, because of the karate, I focused on Japanese theater when I was there, like no Kabuki, Kyogen, uh, Taiko, Nihonbuyo. But halfway through, I took a class in Southeast Asian performance and was like, wow, that's the most interesting thing I've ever seen. I started taking Indonesian language classes. I received a, a fellowship to go to Indonesia for the summer after I graduated. Uh, and after a couple more years of working, realized I, I really needed to know more and went back for my PhD. I went to Ohio University. My PhD is in interdisciplinary arts. And I knew I wanted to focus on Indonesian performance and women. And it's just as I kept studying and learning more and doing more with the puppetry, I realized that this was my focus and um, haven't looked back. Even when I'm writing about theater performance or even literature from Indonesia, I'm constantly referring back to the wayang as a touchstone. Um, I've come, a, yeah, there are sources that do, and I would be more than happy to, to share a bibliography with you. Um, I'm, I suppose in a way I'm much more, uh, the type of work I do is ethnography, and I'm interested in sort of the here and now and the multitude of stories. I do know one of the real differences that, it, for that Indonesia added is the idea that Bisma and Amba fell in love uh, and that then Bisma is the one who, who accidentally shot her with the arrow. In the Indian versions of the story that I've come across, it's much more, the more common one is that Srikandi was born a girl but raised as a boy and then trades genders um, with the hermit in the forest. And also in, in the, Quite often in India, my understanding is, is the story is quite minor, where the character of Srikandi has become a much bigger part of how the story is told in Indonesia, that there's a lot more versions and a lot more references to her. So they, they are actually used at this side because in order for the shadow to show, you, actually, you have to have the puppet against the screen. Otherwise, the shadow becomes really blurry and you, you can't see it. Uh, that doesn't mean that the audiences are small. Uh, audiences are often like hundreds or thousands of people. Today, puppeteers are miked. So a lot of it is also being able to hear the story as well mm -hmm. as see it. Uh, Bali, because of the context being in a temple, and those are smaller puppets, quite often the audience is a little bit smaller, maybe just 100 or 200 people. There is a, a, a couple puppeteers. Uh, the most famous is Chenk Blanc, is kind of his stage name in Bali. And he'll draw crowds of thousands. But he uses, he's designed his own puppets that are much bigger. And then he'll have, you know, sort of if you go see a basketball game, they have those jumbotrons where you can then see like the, they also are filming it. He'll have those jumbotrons off to the side really blowing up the performance and he uses a lot of special effects and like strobe lights and all kinds of things so yeah there definitely have been technical 
adaptations for very large audiences for some of the puppeteers. But yeah, the traditional performance, it's, they still are small, although people don't just sit like we do and typically watch a performance. It's part of sort of a ramai or, um, you know, it's, it's busy and boisterous and that's like really desirable. So people are coming in and out, they're eating, gambling, there might be another performance happening over there. So you can kind of walk up, watch part of the performance from a good vantage point and then wander off and someone else can see the performance as well. In Bali, performances tend to be about three hours long, but in Java, they go all night long. So they'll start around 9 p.m. and go until 6 a.m. We thought rock concerts were long. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer will be staying with us for the reception. Yes. So let's go on over next door to the Castellini room. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much, and thank you again to Jennifer. Yes, thank you.